Hey guys, this is Spacey, and welcome to Chorus Podcast, Filmmaking Actually. Uh, this is an interview with film distributor Eric Lundmark, and uh, they talk film distributing and all that fun stuff. This is part one, so enjoy. Hi, welcome back to my podcast, Filmmaking Actually. Um, I'm here with Eric Lundmark of Leo Mark Studios. He's a very awesome film distributor that I had the honor of meeting at the Capitol Film Market, which is a part of the Nova Film Festival in Northern Virginia. And he has worked in film for decades and finally decided to get more into the business side of things and has worked in film distribution for about 10 years. So I'm very happy to have him with us today. And he's going to be answering some questions about uh, film distribution and what's really important for filmmakers to keep in mind as they go through production and get ready to sell their film. So uh, hello and welcome to Filmmaking Actually. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm, we're absolutely honored to have you. I think that film distribution, it's not something that usually gets talked about that I've seen in like indie filmmaking forums. Everyone's always focused on their gear and the talent and the script and all this stuff, but no one really thinks about what to do once they've made a film. That's true. Making a film is, of course, very, very important to make a good you know, product or a piece of art or however you want to name it. But if you intend it to be a business, you then also have to take it to the next level and treat it as a business, um, if you know if that's your intention, of course. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I have an earlier episode where I said the first thing to do when making a film is to decide, you know, what do you want to do with it? Do you want to go to festivals? Do you want to distribute it? Do you want to um, self-distribute it? Like, there's lots, so many options. Um, mm -hmm. What would you say if someone is, you know, they're starting uh, to plan a film? What would you say is needed by a filmmaker for their film to actually be ready for distribution, like just the technical specs? The technical things, right. Well, we want the deliverables to be um, ProRes 42 HQ at least. If they're shooting uh, 2K, 4K or more, um, there's really still only two formats that are being delivered at the TV and, and digital, which is UHD or HD, which is 1080p, right? Um, mm -hmm. So you got to make sure you can deliver those files. Um, even if you shoot with a camera that shoots compressed, you know, many, many DSLR cameras that shoot MP4s or whatever. But when you master it, you have to master out to one of these uh, high-res formats because that's what we want. Uh, and then, you know, just learn a little bit. If you don't have any skilled technicians on your team learn a little bit about the QC process to make sure your uh, visuals are within the so-called legal broadcast specs you know the brightness and 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 the, and the blacks and the chroma so don't oversaturate things uh, same thing with the audio make sure the audio is within uh, good specs we don't want to see audio mixed like a pop song for radio where everything is slamming <laughs> the top with zero no it should be for theatrical it's minus 18 minus 20 dialogue normal or for digital release or tv is usually minus 12 so just be uh, aware of these things and also what we see all the time i can't tell you how many times you see this when in the audio section in between cuts they, they forget to do little crossfades just just a few frames on either side and there's pops you know in in the noise background you have this mm. psh, poo, psh, poo, and that's <laughs> going to get flagged in qc and it's going to get rejected so you have to if you don't do it first you're going to have to redo it later so you might as well just spend the extra time and make sure you crossfade all the cuts of uh, production sound um, many many times also we we have we see the master coming from the color grading house and they output the final master and they forget to pan the soundtracks left and right so we <laughs> end up with a dual mono master and that's gonna have to be redone too so there's like a checklist uh, e simple checklist and if if someone works with us before they create a master we can send that over you, just, you know uh, it's like an idiot-proof checklist to make sure you don't do things that are like really, really simple. Right. Um, I know I have a couple of friends who work in post sound, and one of the things that they said is really important, like kind of just like a basic, isn't it like to not mix your dialogue and your soundtrack and your sound design into one track? 
like so you can't extract the dialogue to do like dubbing in other languages is that does that happen well or? i mean you always mix it down to a stereo master or surround master but at the same time you do need to separate them if you intend to do foreign dubs so you, you do need we, we call it m and e tracks music and effects so you have um a fully filled foley track that goes into the effects so you have all the sound effects and foley meaning you have to recreate whatever is missing from production if you cut out all the dialogue if you see someone making something that should make a noise there should be a noise there so you, you do have to spend probably a week to two weeks depending how busy the movie is just doing foley to fill fill that in uh, so you have one stereo track with effects and then you have one stereo track with music or surround stems too. It depends on how, how ambitious you want to be. But if you don't have those, we can't do foreign sales to countries that like to dub the movies. Good note. Um, so uh, when a filmmaker is like starting pre-production, like, I mean, I'm an over planner. Um, I know not everyone uh, digs in as far as I do when it comes to like post during pre-production what should a filmmaker consider during pre-production when they're planning for a film that they are hoping to get distribution on um yeah if we're looking at the film as a commercial product that they want distribution and make money from and so on the best bet is to start a dialogue with an established distributor and saying and, and show us the project saying, here's the idea, here's the synopsis, here's what we're thinking of doing. And then based on our experience, we can come in and help you and saying, well, this looks promising and let's try to get one name in there or, or so on. And Or if we feel the film might not have a good chance commercially, then we're going to say that. I don't think, at least based on our experience, I don't think this is going to work as a commercial project. Try to go for a festival film and get a lot of accolades and do more of an artistic, creative piece and maybe because of that get hired um, as a craftsperson on someone else's project you know th there's different functions everything doesn't have to be a business it could also be that you just make a movie that you believe in so strongly and because of your personal conviction it turns out really really well artistically and you win festivals and so on and um, maybe after a while the film gets picked up by a distributor because of that, even though it wasn't planned as a commercial project from the beginning, it might work further down the line because you have gained so, so many festival laurels and accolades, etc. That's interesting. I was warned by one person that uh, festival, um, they're like, festivals is not a distribution plan. It's nice to hear that that actually is, because like you see it at, you know, obviously Sundance and bigger festivals, but um, I always like talking to more than one person on a subject because sometimes you'll get one person who's like, oh, no, you can't do that. And then you talk to someone else and they're like, you can totally do that. <laughs> yeah. So um, <laughs> it's no, nice to have that. Ab absolutely. The laurels, they <laughs> make a difference. I mean, I think it's just human nature. We see these laurels and we go, "Ooh, nice laurels. Oh, I'm, I'm, this makes the film look really good. And and we're just wired that way that when we see accolades like that, we go, oh, I'm sure that's really good. I mean, if you get into one of the top five festivals, Sundance and et cetera, you, you are guaranteed to be in the running to be considered by you know, a major distributor that can put major, major financing behind a marketing campaign. That's like a different mm. league. And if you do happen to get in there all on your own accord, that's like winning the lottery. And that's nice, oh, yeah. but it's very, very hard to plan to win the lottery. But we can help you plan a, a film and distribution um, from the beginning. That that's doable. We, we can we we can do make we, we can make a plan. That's fine. That's and that's and it's nice because sometimes it does feel a little bit like every part of filmmaking is like winning the lottery. So it's nice to to know that there's like some nitty gritty that you can put in and and plan. Um, right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, let's talk about some of the nitty gritty. Um, the runtime, uh, would you say, like, obviously a feature film I know is uh, more, has more saleability uh, than, say, a short, but does the, how much does the runtime, say, an hour, hour and a half long movie versus a two, two and a half hour long movie? How, how would that affect the saleability of it? If your goal is to sell it to television of some kind, then you want to think very traditionally, around 90 minutes, because otherwise they can't fit it in their slots. 
And even mm. if you have a longer film, then you can make a TV cut, which might be necessary anyway, because let's say you have too much nudity or violence that won't be allowed for TV, then you have to make a TV version uh, or an mm. airline version. And this is done with a lot of films. They always make you know, a PG or PG-13 version that is TV safe or airline safe. Um, and that might be a lot shorter. So it's very hard with a, with a film that's too long to, f to fit it into television. For digital, eh, it doesn't matter. You know, it, there's no limitation because you're, you're just collecting revenue when the viewers are watching the movie. If it's too short, there will be an issue too. If it's only like 60, 62 minutes and so on, they can't slot it as a, f as a feature. Then it's like a one hour special and then they have certain parameters and quotas for, okay, where are we gonna put that then? Because it's, um, <coughs> it's very, <coughs> How should I say corporate? <laughs> when once you start working with television, it's very corporate, and, and it's like, oh, you just put it here. No, 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 no. They have certain slots for different kinds of programming, and if your film is too short, it will also be an issue, especially if it's supposed to be a narrative. A documentary that might work as a hour-long feature, um, but then you should also make a TV version, which is anywhere from like 45 to 52 minutes, which is called a commercial hour, so they can uh, mm. fit in their uh, commercial breaks. Let's say, uh, you know, okay, so I'm an indie filmmaker, um, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at, you know, I have a script, I, I'm, I have either a good runtime planned out for whatever I'm looking for. Um, how, like, um, pre-sales, is that something that, like, I know, obviously, if I'm a big studio and I walk in and I'm like, hi, I have the next Captain Marvel movie, like, that's not gonna be a problem. But if I'm, you know, random person with random script, uh, how possible is it to get something like a pre-sale offer as an indie filmmaker? Uh, it's still possible, but it's a lot harder than it used to be. Um, before the economic crash in 2008, 2009, we hear all these stories of in the filmmakers uh, going to one of these markets like Cannes or AFM or Berlin or Hong Kong with a script and a mock-up poster or even not even a script, a synopsis, just an idea and a poster and they were able to raise you know, anywhere from 50,000 to 300,000 or even more maybe. But it wasn't difficult to raise pre-sales based on, on an idea of a you know, genre, what you call a genre movie, which is like a mm. horror, sci-fi action, something that is uh, selling on its visual strength more than the the cast names, right? But today, mm. because of the changes in the industry and the changes in how people watch movies, you know, the DVD store is gone and, and it's all streaming and Netflix have basically taken over. So the only chance to get pre-sales today is you need to have what's known as a package. And what does that mean is that you need to have a finished script, of course. You also mm -hmm. need to have one strong name attached because f the fame factor is the real currency of the film business. And the fame factor can be fame, you know, well-known cast, a well-known director, producer. It could be a well-known subject matter. It could be based on a well-known book or a comic book or a political event, historical event. Something that the audience already has a connection to. And in the industry, this is called as pre-awareness. So <laughs> the, the more pre-awareness of topic or an actor or something like that has with the audience, the bigger the chance that it's gonna be a commercial success. If you have an unknown story with an unknown filmmaker, with an unknown cast, it's very, very hard <clears throat> to get the audience on the receiving end to go, ooh, wow, what is this? I have to see this. You know, it, it, just think about what you watch and how you select films yourself when you're browsing through iTunes or Netflix or wherever you browse movies. What is it that makes you go, wow, I have to see that? And then reverse analyze that in how you want to present your own film. But back to the pre-sales. So I would say you got to have a good script, not just an idea, a good script, one name attached, and you have to have a really good presentation um, with the director's statement where he or she has a vision uh, how the production design is going to look, what the color scheme is going to be, and the different locations. Even if it's not the real location, it needs to have a visual idea 
of what it's going to look like. And then we might be able to get a few pre-sales here and there. But the thing is, with pre-sales, they're going to pay a lot less <clears throat> because you're taking a risk up front than if you would just sell the movie after it's done. If the, when the movie's done and it's really good and they want it, you can negotiate a higher price. So the flip side of pre-sales is that it's not going to be a ton of money because you're taking this risk up front. Mm. So maybe getting pre-sales isn't like, I mean, obviously it totally depends on the filmmaker and the project and their budget and what their needs are. But I personally had the impression that like, oh, you should try and get pre-sales. But I guess uh, there probably isn't a good blanket uh, answer for that. You probably have to look and see what you know, if if you know you're going to make an amazing movie, maybe you should wait until you make it before you try and sell it. No, that's not necessarily. I just don't try to finance the whole movie through pre-sales because it's probably not going to happen. But if you get two or three pre-sales, that's fine. So you might look at your budget and you have, all right, a fixed amount, and then you're going to get some in tax incentives. You're going to get some in. Uh, deferred payment, some, you know, all this, what we call soft money, you get some in pre in pre sales. So you might only have to raise maybe 30% of your budget in cash, the rest are uh, is considered soft money. And then you see it starts to kind of make sense. Oh, I don't have to raise a million, I have to raise 300,000. Okay, well, this is different. So that that's what we can help with uh, as a distributor and also if if you have a good attorney that is used to de doing these things they can help you figure this out how much cash do you actually raise on a 1 million dollar movie and but another thing you th should think about with pre-sales the idea of reaching out to the pr prospective buyers and say if i make this would you be interested that mindset is a good mindset because you, you you have to do that, I think. And even if you don't make pre-sales, just the vetting process of would you be interested in this will give you a really good sense of if the film is going to be successful. If they're in, interested and excited, then you go, ah, I might have something here. If you don't get any responses to your emails or, or lukewarm responses, then you know, um, this might not be that successful commercially. It, might be, it still might be a really good artistic piece, but then that's a different path. So what would you say, um, like obviously to even consider distribution, like you said, it has to be like a good and interesting story. It has to have some relatability. Um, it has to have certain technical specifications. You know, you can't have the sound cutting in and out. You can't have shoddy camera work or shots out of focus or, you know, really poor performances from any of the departments. Um, so let's just say that, you know, um, a, the, a film is a good, uh, it's a good solid story. It's interesting. Audiences respond positively to it. It's well made. The acting is really good. The sound is well done. The cinematography is very beautiful. Um, are those, like, if you have all those things in, would you say that that would raise your chances? Like, it, it would be, fair. I mean, obviously nothing's for sure, but it would be fairly sure to get a distribution, or is there still more that kind of comes into play beyond those factors? Sure. Quality is always a, a determining factor when we look at films. Uh, we, we try to, to have our bar that we try to pass is skillfully crafted. We try not to make, say if films are good or bad because that's too sure. subjective and personal. But what we can measure and judge is, is it good craft? Do they know what they're doing? right? And, and that is absolutely something we look at. And that will, if we have two films about that are similar, but one is better made, mm -hmm. uh, then we probably will pick that one over the other one. Okay. And obviously, um, I know you would suggest working with a sales representative, but would you uh, be able to kind of speak to the pros and cons of self-distribution versus working with a sales rep? Sure. We, yeah, we, we get this question a lot, and a lot of filmmakers might have had a bad experience in the past with a company that wasn't very forthcoming or, or you know, not reporting. And they basically had a really bad experience with their pr previous distributors, and now they want to do self-distribution. So we talk about that yeah sure yeah there are a lot of possibilities you can do when you self-distribute um the, the platforms are there you can put it on youtube and vimeo and, and you can charge money for it etc 
just know that it's very time consuming. You have to make a decision. How do I wanna, do I want to spend my next five years? Do I just want to promote this one film I just made? Because it is a full-time job. Every hat you put on, even if it's not technically difficult, it takes a lot of time. Or <laughs> do I want to do that? Or do I rather team up with other people and focus on my next movie? Because I think much as filmmaking is a team sport, film distribution is a team sport too. And it's not that what we do is difficult. I um, mean, you know, I, I always compare with you know playing an instrument because that's my background. I spent many, many years practicing my guitar and I became pretty good. But uh, doing distribution and so on, it's not that you have to practice for many years before you get good at it. What happens is we develop a network of connections that we meet at these film markets and so on. And that's the value because it is a business of connections. If I can email someone that knows me and responds to me right away, I will m much more likely have a chance of, of doing business than if a totally unknown person emails that same person and they say, I don't know this one, I don't have time for this, I, I don't know what this is about. You know, it's that vetting process that we have already done, so we have established channels with um, colleagues all over the world. Um, so, yeah, we tell these filmmakers, sure, if you're really, really bent on doing yourself, go right ahead. But we also say, sure, you can do a lot of stuff yourself. You can cut your own hair, you can fix your own car, you can change your plumbing. But do you really want to? <laughs> you know, everything takes time. So I just think it's a team sport. That's a good point. I always say whenever you're making something, you can invest, you know, time like you can invest your time or you can invest your money like you can spend time learning how to do something and then doing it or you can hire someone who already knows how to do it and get them to do it for you so um right what about like like the the legal i know obviously neither of us are lawyers and none of this nothing in this podcast is legal advice but um like, what do you require from a filmmaker let's say uh, i was talking to a friend and they told me a story and then I decided to make a movie out of it and I had them help me, but I never got them uh, to sign a release. And now I'm trying to sell the movie, but they still have a claim to the work. Um, could I like still sell it? Or like, what do I need from the people that I'm collaborating with before I'm able to sell a film? Yeah, that's called a chain of title. And that's something mm -hmm. we do require. Uh, it is, you should register the script uh, with the Writers Guild or, or the Copyright Bureau. And you should also register the finished film with the Copyright Bureau because then you get a case number and you have your name on that film that you own it. Because whoever signs the contract needs to show proof that they own the film and they have the right to actually go into a, a legal contract with the distributor. You also should make sure that you have release forms from all the actors, all the extras, anyone who's on camera, you need a release form f f from. Uh, especially the music, if you work with, with songs and bands or if you work with a composer or both, you need uh, uh, license deals, release forms and all that, the music cue sheet. You need to have all your paperwork in order because you'd be surprised how many times when we release a film and there's some obscure actor that pops out of the woodwork saying, hey, you can't release that. I was in there. I, don't, I didn't ever give my permission to do that. And then it became this legal battle over nothing or it seems like nothing uh, so just <laughs> make sure you have signed release forms from anyone who is ever in contact with with your work smart what happens if you don't have it like let's say you um i remember there was a, a girl who was looking at having me come in uh to direct her project and um she wanted uh to talk to me about it and she said she'd been working with some other writers on the script and then she asked me to come in um, to take a look at the script and see if I'd be interested in directing it. And one of the first things I asked was if she had release forms from those writers because their work was like they had done revisions of the script. Mm -hmm. And she was like, well, no, you know, we're all friends. We were just collaborating. Um, and I said, no, <laughs> because I didn't, it just seemed a little too weird from what she was saying. But what would have happened if, uh, let's say we got, you know, I went ahead and I directed it and we got distribution and she promised me like back end points once it was sold and then we go to sell it 
and she signs a thing saying, oh, yeah, no, I registered this. This is mine. And then the other writers come out and they're like, no, no, that's mine. You, 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 I never signed a thing. I never agreed to that. Yeah. Um, it's, what happens? It's yeah. tricky. I, I, I don't know how to answer this specifically, but the, the mm -hmm. bottom line is if, if, no, if, if there's a dispute, <clears throat> the film will have to come down. That, you know, if a lawyer, if someone hires a lawyer and because they, they work with the law and and if they say you have to do this you have to do that <laughs> i mean they're not a police officer but they do represent the law and they are supposed to know it really well unless you get your own lawyer and they start to argue and rack up a bill <laughs> mostly what happens is the film will have to come down and that that's usually all there is to it so the film is dead there's no more money and it's not out there and that makes sense. That's probably not something you want to do after you've gotten millions of dollars invested into your project and got no, the no, 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 no. If if you have that kind of budget, you, I'm sure the people you work with know what to do with regards to legal, uh, legal issues like that. <laughs> um, so I know, um, like I've been to a couple of film distribution panels, and I know they talk a lot about like action uh, or horror. Like those are really easy to sell because. You know, it's harder with like a comedy because, you know, different cultures, different languages, jokes don't always translate. Drama mm -hmm. doesn't always translate. Um, how how vital would you say genre is? Should I be like, oh, I need to make a horror film. And if I'm not making horror, I'm not getting international distribution or like how how much does that really affect um, the distribution? It does to a certain extent, if you can't get that fame factor, like we talked about, mm -hmm. if you don't have the fame factor or that pre-awareness, something that the audience can already relate to, then the visuals is what you have. Uh, and it's very primal. <clears throat> so it's going to be either very scary or sexy or very, very romantic. Uh, it, it sounds like cliches, and it is, but that's what we see you know, um, but another thought about this whole international distribution, international sales, I think you shouldn't think too much about, oh, we have to sell this internationally. You know, the U.S. is a really, really big market. It's the, it's the, besides China, which is really weird to work with anyway, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, U.S. is the biggest market in the world. I think you should focus on making the film work here because it's going to be in English and this is where everybody else wants to have their movies distributed. So before you just think, oh, what's going to work in France? What's going to work in Russia and so on? You just think, what's going to work here at home? <laughs> right. uh, and then, of course, UK and Australia will be thrown in for, for free because, you know, English-speaking territories are easy. Mm -hmm. um, it's very hard to make one movie that fits every country because they have very, very different tastes. Even in the horror genre or action or what, whatever you have, it, it's very hard to make a movie that one size fits all. But if you can make a movie that fits the U.S. audience, this is a huge market. Um, yeah, the genre does matter if you don't have the fame factor. That's the simple answer. No, that's a. I think that's a great answer, and it's it's also nice to hear because you do hear a lot of people talking about China and talking about international sales and talking about all this, um, and you kind of forget that there's a giant market of film viewers in America, like people who would want to watch Netflix subscribers, Amazon Prime subscribers, TV viewers. Like there's millions and millions of people. Oh yeah. Um, just in the U.S. Um, so yeah, no, that's a good reminder. Yeah. Okay, that concludes part one of Cora's interview with Eric Lundmark. Be sure to tune in next time for part two. It's going to be great. Okay, here's the end credits. See ya! You've been listening to Filmmaking Actually with Cora Linda, Space Dream Productions podcast. Subscribe to us on any or all the podcast platforms, but we especially recommend our sponsor, Anchor. If you like what you hear, leave us five-star ratings and positive reviews on iTunes and Stitcher. It helps more listeners like you discover the show. But the best thing you can do if you really like the show is tell a friend. Want to leave a comment or ask a question? Email at filmmakingactually at gmail.com. This is Spacey speaking. This is the way I have spoken, doing, talking. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>